Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending today. The person's got a hand up. <laughs> the person, would you like to be more than a attendee? <laughs> Welcome. We've got a couple other people coming in. Awesome. All right. Hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, welcome everyone. You've got a couple of team members here today. So we've got Amanda, Kirsten and Kira in here today. Actually, Knox is tied up, so he's in here linked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excellent. So you're not Knox today. <laughs> um, awesome. Okay. So in today's session, we're going to be going through compliance and reporting and the requirements around um, what you need to be doing because it's the annual declaration of compliance is due at the end of this month. So I'm just going through, um, I haven't moved this down. So it's complying reporting. We're looking at standards 2.1, 2.2, 8.4, 8.6. And then we'll have a little look at the cry costs, uh, but the more, the most of the focus will be on the annual declaration of compliance. Cause I don't think we've got anybody on line who is doing cry costs. Is that correct, Amanda? Yeah, we've, we've got um, at least one Krakos person that I can see in the list. All right then. Okay, so I'll have a look at that. But uh, high priority today is the annual step deck, step deck and what you'll need to do, um, what you need to submit for that. So as per usual, this uh, webinar will is recorded and it will be available following uh, within the next couple of days up on vivacity.training. I will be doing something a little bit different and I'll be doing this for the next, oh, it's gonna change, all of it's gonna change. So because we've got all the standards under review right now, um, what I'll be doing is as I go through the standards, I'll also be identifying what the proposed changes will be moving forward when the new uh, standards and draft standards come out. And so each of these webinars each month are going to be a little bit different. And as we learn more about what those changes are going to be, and the draft standards are due to come out in August. So, um, so there will be even more that we'll be discussing because we'll be going through, okay, what are those draft standards? Now, if you attended this morning, you would have heard uh, we're going to be running a vet reform workshop. So it's going to be a one day workshop that we're going to run. So it's going to be two two events that we're going to run. One's going to be a one day workshop um, and it's a focus group really. So when the new standards or the draft standards come out, we're going to hold a focus group so that we can as a group get together and discuss what the impact those standards, proposed changes to the standards will be to you and your RTO. And we'll be brainstorming that together, what, what we think will work, what we think will not work. Um, and then the idea is, is that we take that data we collect and we'll submit a, um, a report back to uh, the, um, who's looking after standards, the VET reform, uh, the VET reform, which is DESI, the Department of Education um, Services, and we'll submit um, our feedback based on that forum. So that's the idea around that. The other thing we're looking at doing is um, we've got a, another vet reform workshop that we're going to be attending next week, uh, which is with the, um, uh, the body that's doing the uh, vet reform. So they've actually got an independent outside organization who's running these focus groups. And the next one will be around the standards. So we're going to be attending that, Amanda Kirsten and I are attending that one, where we're going to learn more about no, it's not learning actually, it's giving feedback on the standards and what we think of the standards and where are the gaps and where are the issues and concerns. Now we've already addressed a lot of them in the surveys that we've completed, um, also in the um, sessions that we've already attended. 
uh, we've already had a few of those that we have um, submitted. Uh, and that was through the focus group. So if you haven't attended the focus group that, or the workshops, they're called the vet reform workshops. If you haven't attended any of those, give your feedback to us because we're quite happy to then incorporate that into our feedback. And I keenly encourage you to go on the Facebook uh, group. So the members Facebook group of which I'm sure Kira is quickly going to get the link for you right now. <laughs> um, so the members Facebook group, so that's anybody who's a member can join on there. That's where we'll notify you of events is on there. We're also, um, we're doing surveys already on there about the vet reform and micro-credentialing. Now, if you've been um, not attending any of our sessions and you don't know what we're talking about, uh, the vet, there's the whole vet sector is under review at the moment. So we had the National Skills Commission that was put together to identify you know, issues with training products and packages and things like that. Um, we've also had uh, Minister Steve Irons and Michaela Cash looking at what are the issues within the vet sector. ASCOR are currently undergoing a audit. So they're being audited about how are they complying against the Regulator Act. So it's looking at the Regulator Act and what are they doing uh, compliance against that. And then uh, what's happening is a lot of the standards are uh, going to change. So the Regulator Act, we've already seen a couple of minor changes come through, uh, but the standards for RTOs, they're still debating on whether they're going to do a total rewrite. Sounds like it at the moment. It might be a total rewrite or it will be a... Um, uh, review of the standards that are there right now. A lot of the feedback that I've been giving is it's not necessarily that the standards are the issue, it's the way we've been regulated against those standards and the inconsistencies between auditors when it comes to going to audit and we're being audited with the same standards but different benchmarks which are set by each individual auditor. So that's one thing that we've really identified is an issue. Some of the suggestions that I've already gone back with is that we should have, the ASCO auditors should have a benchmark and they should be assessing all of the RTOs against that bench, benchmark. The other issue I've identified and that we've put feedback to is standard 1.8, which is training uh, assessment tools. So the big thing with assessments is, and volume of learning and amount of training is you can't really benchmark an AQF level all at the same because, you know, a certificate three in hairdressing is nothing like a certificate three in business. So it it's, should be in within the training package. That's what uh, my recommendation has been, is that it should be in the training package. So, um, so it's a great opportunity for you to have a voice and to put your voice forward with what you propose should, should change. Um, as an initial registration, because I know we've got a couple of initial registrations online, um, this is just a really good learning process for you, watching this all happen. I would, um, would encourage you to join in in the sessions that we're going to be doing and even the vet reform focus group. Um, and the main reason why is because you will learn a lot more and be ahead of the game when it comes to the new standards coming out. So I do recommend that you get involved with that. So lots of uh, new things that are going to be happening. So lots of changes this year um, and lots of things that you're um, going to need to know. Um, but the great thing is, is that we're going to be here to support you the whole way um, when, as you're a member. Um, so I've just taken a note. Uh, Kira just uh, stated that, you know, uh, to Philippe that he can be registered individually to attend these webinars. As members, and depending on your membership level, we can invite more than one person from your team. So you can have your individual login. Um, and those individual logins include attending the monthly webinars, attending the mastermind, and your login into vivacity.training. So vivacity.training has a lot of uh, information in there, lots of courses. All of these webinars are recorded and they're placed on there. We've got about four years worth, maybe more, of these monthly um, monthly webinars that is on Vivacity Training. And um, uh, they're still relevant whereby um, 
you can look back on the old ones, but as the new ones come in, like, there's going to be massive changes now. I was going to do a whole heap of work on um, new presentations and things like that for the um, for the standards, but because they're all going to change, I'm going to uh, hold that off and work on uh, keeping you up to date with what those changes are going to be and how they're going to impact your RTO. Okay, so moving along, we've got a few people online now. So thank you very much, everybody who is attending today. It's so good to see so many people online today. So we've got 15 people online, which is awesome. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to push it, but I'd love to see you guys on the masterminds, which are on Monday mornings at 10.30 a.m., uh, because you'll find that the masterminds will have a very big impact on your business side of running your RTO. Okay, so first clause we're going to uh, start with is standard 2.1, which is complying with legislation. Um, basically, what this standard means is if you're non-compliant with any of the other standards, you're going to be non-compliant with this standard. Um, and it's something that the auditors use more for a draw card when um, they identify that there's something else non-compliant within your organisation. I, um, I suspect this one will be combined with the next one, which is the continuous improvement one, uh, because it's, uh, it really doesn't mean anything unless you, um, because it, what happens is you can't be non-compliant with this clause by itself. It's only if you're non-compliant with any of the other standards. So it's really um, a useless uh, clause. <laughs> Okay, so clause 2.2 is all around continuous improvement and it's looking at what do you have in place within your organisation to ensure continuous improvement of your training practices and services, training assessment practices and services. Um, and it's looking at different strategies that you can put in place and we've got a number of them with the vivacity policies and procedures of which I'll be going through some of those. Um, and the most important part is how are you collecting data, analyzing that data, and then acting on that data. And then following that is monitoring the data. But it's really that acting, analyze, and collect. So acting is, you know, something's occurred, uh, might be a complaint or appeal, opportunity for improvement, or WHS, training package change. There's a lot of things that could happen that would um, you know, mean that you would need to act on, on, on a change or something like that. Um, it's uh, collecting the data against all of that. So uh, once, in, you know, something may occur, it's collecting data on that so that you can improve your practices moving forward. So that's the main uh, area with that is looking at how you can improve your practices based on the data that you've collected and really analysing that to create a better, um, better RTO and looking into the insights of your organisation. So let's have a look at some of the strategies that we've got. So with the continuous improvement strategy, you'll see, and we're going to have a look at the document, there's a document that is on Unicorn, whereby we've actually developed a strategy for you that includes all of the data you collect, how you act on that data and how you monitor that data. If you haven't downloaded that document yet, I highly recommend that you do. So it's called the Continuous Improvement Strategy and the Continuous Improvement Strategy includes, you know, it's really good for newbies um, within an RTO. It's also really good for new employees within your RTO because it really gives you a snapshot of why we collect the data, what are we doing with that data, what you should be doing, like uh, improving your practices and how are you reporting on that? So we've got the annual declaration of compliance is one uh, such form of uh, report that we're going to be doing. So it's really looking at the types of stakeholders. So who's involved, is it students, trainers, administration staff, employers, industry, there's a range of different stakeholders that could be involved with that data that you're collecting the types of data that you're collecting. So it could be commencement completions, uh, might be complaints, it might be an appeal, uh, might be ass assessment validation. So there's all sorts of different types of data that we can collect. How are you collecting that? So what's the mechanisms for doing that? Assessment validation um, session that you could hold is one example, uh, facilitating that. 
It's also looking at the timing of the data collection. So when are you collecting it? Um, how often are you collecting it? And then looking at when we go to report it as well. What's really important is when you collect that data is that you analyze it, that you look at it and you go, okay, this is what works, this is what doesn't work. How could we improve our practices based on the data that we've collected? So this is what's really important when you look at assessment validation is looking at that data and how can you improve your practices based on the data collected? Who is responsible? So um, someone within your organisation, or it could be someone external to the organisation, but it's really identifying who is that person that's responsible for ensuring this data is collected, acted upon, and analysed and acted upon. How will the data be acted upon? So what are you going to do? So if it's a complaints and appeals, what's your process for doing that? So we have a complaints and appeals form, and then we have a whole process within the form uh, that you can monitor. Implementation of improvements, because that's the really important part, is um, when we collect the data, analyze it, what are the opportunities for improvement from the data that we've collected to uh, ensure that we've got quality education? And then of course, the monitoring of that data. So there's a simple process for continuous improvement. And one of the, um, th this is the reason why I made that continuous improvement strategy is to make it a simple process for you to be able to follow. So it's all about collecting that feedback and that can be from industry, employers, trainers, students, and even other team members within your organization. Then it's reviewing that feedback and identifying opportunities for improvement based on the feedback to ensure that you're addressing both industry and student needs when to ensure that you have the best quality outcomes. And then um, quite often it's going to be adjusting your training and assessment. So it might be the practices or the training and assessment strategy, or it could even be your policies and procedures within your organization and looking at how can you improve and minimize the risk of the um, incident or occurrence happening again. Hold, and the big thing that we say is hold regular meetings. So at least once a month, you should be holding a quality and compliance meeting. So we have the quality and compliance manual, which is also known as the Q&C manual. And we also have uh, recommend that you do a quality and compliance or Q&C meeting once a month. So I'll be going through that process today of what you should be doing within that uh, meeting. So this is the continuous improvement strategy. So if you haven't downloaded it yet, uh, you should log into Unicorn uh, and access this uh, document, which is a great overview. When the standards first changed, we were using this as an audit document, uh, but now it's not so much a focus um, in audits, but we have found it is very, very good for you to have a snapshot. And particularly when you're preparing for an audit is really to have a look at that data and how are you collecting it? How are you acting on it? The other thing you can do, because this is in a Word document, you can contextualize this to meet your RTO requirements. So if you want to add additional documents or forms or change the document names because you call them a different name, you can go into the doc document and edit this. And as I said earlier, it's really good for new, um, new employees in your team. So it really gives you a snapshot of who are, who, what, how, when, um, and what we're doing with that data and then how we're improving it. So the data we collect is from students, trainers, industry, and then it could be internally within the RTO. So for students, it's, of course, it's feedback, getting feedback from them, commencement and completion ratings, uh, the quality indicator report form. Now, uh, with the quality indicator, this is one of the areas I think will be going or having a significant change because originally the quality indicator was written against the AQF, so the Australian Qualifications Framework. AQF is all being rewritten at the moment um, and we're, uh, they're changing the whole lot into like micro-credentialing and looking at levels instead of certificates. So there's gonna be a massive change there. So I do see it's definitely not gonna be related to the AQF. Um, it'll be related more at student feedback. I think there are much better ways that we could be collecting data from our students that is not you know, based on the quality indicators because I, I find that the data we're collecting on the quality indicators isn't realistic 
for how to improve your practices within your organisation. Um, I think there are a lot better quality questions that we could ask that is not all multiple choice. Interesting enough, uh, when ASQA audit us as an RTO and they look at the data we've collected for industry consultation, they don't like ticky flicky boxes. They want comments and statements, but their quality indicator form, it's not like that. It's ticky box and it's you now a ranking out of high to low. So it's very interesting that that's what the government expects us to submit from our students, but we're not, um, but we've got to submit so much more when it comes to industry consultation. So, um, so I see this having a major shake up. Uh, the biggest issue that has been identified by the National Skills Commission is the training and assessment that we're currently providing um, to industry and to students to complete to get work in the industry is not meeting the skills requirements of the employers right now. So we've got a constantly changing industry at the moment with COVID and the way we work is never going to be the same again. So it's really focusing on, and I've said this many times with our uh, clients, you really need to focus on the education for the future. What are the needs of industry from now and the future? Because it's gonna be very different from what it was in the past. And that's what micro-credentialing is all about. So what the National Skills Commission identified is that the qualifications that we have aren't meeting the skill sets required within the workforce. And it's not necessarily that they need a full qualification. It might be a cluster of units or it might be a single unit, but it's giving better recognition for that instead of having to go for a full qualification. So this is where we really need to get creative right now and really identify by talking to industry and engaging with them and identifying what can we do to improve our training and assessment practices to meet your needs? How could we cluster a set of units to meet your needs. So it's really identifying what are the gaps? What gaps do you have within your organization? And then how can you meet that? One of the things that uh, I did when I had my RTO is I actually collaborated with another RTO to, um, and she actually approached me to develop a teacher's aid course. At the time, there were no training. There was no nationally recognized qualification. Um, for teachers aid and now it's uh, education support. Um, they, they do actually have a uh, qualification for it now, but at that time they didn't. She specialized in childcare and I specialized in business. So we collaborated and we put a course together and it was just as many units as a full qualification. We submitted that and the government actually approached um, uh, us to develop this course for them. So we identify what were the skills gaps, what, what did they need in order to work as a teacher's aid, um, looking at the children's services units and also looking at the business services units. And then we uh, wrote a course and then the government funded it. So it's getting creative, it's asking, you know, it might be collaborating with other RTOs that are experts in their area. Um, it's also going to industry and really identifying what do industry need. So that's just an example of some data that you can collect for improving your practices. Um, the other one is doing industry surveys and consultation. Um, and I highly recommend focus groups are really good for doing that. Um, one that we've identified that a lot of people are doing is if, you, if your trainers are not involved with your meetings, um, that they should do a monthly report to give you feedback so that you can act on that feedback to improve your practices. So uh, this document, the trainer's report is on Unicorn. So you can access this one as well. I'm gonna be going through a few of the documents today. So I'll be showing you um, what, the, what this all relates to. And then of course for an RTO, it's assessment validation, holding those um, monthly meetings, and then really identifying opportunities for improvement within your organization. So let's start with the industry survey first. So there, we've got a document that you can use for industry surveys. Um, I highly recommend uh, you can do this in SurveyMonkey, which people are more likely to complete a SurveyMonkey than they are a written form. But the other way you can do it is by over the phone. Um, you should be doing this at least annually at least annually. So as an ongoing uh, continuous improvement, 
you should be doing surveys. You know, it could be that you do one blast once a year, or it could be that you're doing them regularly. So it might be once a month, you're focused on different areas. Um, the other one that we recommend is doing a focus group where you can get industry in. Uh, we're looking at in the future, uh, putting together focus groups ourselves where we'll bring industry together and then invite our clients to come along um, and participate in the focus group. So uh, this is something that we've identified because uh, there are a lot of concerns with particularly small RTOs where they're not actually able to engage with industry because they don't know how to or who to go to or they don't have time. So if we can bring it all together and then um, do a half day session where we're doing a focus group, um, that should help you stay, save time. So we're looking at a process like that. So this is the trainer's report. So the trainer's report is a document that the trainer can complete that can give feedback on how their last month went, um, what was the biggest challenge that they had in the last month, what was, you know, goals that they kicked in the last month. Um, the other one is, did they identify with any of their training and assessments and improvements that may need to be made to the training and assessment strategy? It could even be the assessment tools. They might have feedback on that on how to improve the assessment tools. So if you're a trainer assessor who's also involved with the meetings, so your quality and compliance meetings, you don't uh, really need to do a trainer's report because you'll be involved with the meeting, but uh, I can, you still can get your trainers to complete it. So when I had my RTO, I had all of my trainers because I didn't attend the Q&C meeting. Um, I had all of them complete a trainer's report, which had to be submitted to me two days before we held our Q&C meeting, which we hold on a regular day each month. So once you get into the routine of it, it does make it much easier uh, for getting that trainer's report back. So the other one is uh, opportunities for improvement form. So this is where you can get feedback from a range. So it can be internally, it can be your trainers, your students, employers, industry, there's lots of different um, areas where you can get opportunities for improvement. So it's where you identified a weakness. So there might be a weakness within the organization or a weakness in the process or a weakness in assessment tool or something like that. And then what is the opportunity for improvement to improve your practices based on that? So um, this form I used to also use when I had my RTO. Um, and it was a way that I could give my, in particular, my trainers and assessors to come to me with solutions, not just problems. So they would identify what the problem was and where the gap was, and then give suggestions for improvement. In particular, like they're the industry experts, so they're going to know a lot more than I, like I had over 35 different qualifications on my scope from five different training packages. So I couldn't be over everything. So for example, we had one where a trainer came to me and said, um, our assessment tools are out of date because they now refer to old legislation. They need to be updated. I don't know what that legislation should be. So I gave this trainer the opportunity for improvement form. And I said, can you attach any documents that is relevant? So it might be the relevant legislation that needs to be updated. Whereabouts in the assessment tool? Does it need to be updated? Is it all over the place or is it just in one specific se section? And what do you believe should be included in the assessment tool? So it's a great way to empower your trainers and assessors to give feedback to you to improve. Because in the majority, I find that trainers and assessors generally want to provide quality service and they want to be able to ensure that the assessment tools are collecting the evidence that it needs to collect. So why not you know, take them on board and get their feedback? Okay, so another form you can use is the WHS, WHS incidents form. So the WHS incident form, as most people would know from their industry, it's a, a form that you use for recording incidences within the RTO. It can be used as a legal document as well as uh, being a WHS document. So it's something where you're recording any instances that have occurred, the time, the date, the person, where did it happen, um, you've got all of that in there. Who, do, who got involved? Was the police involved? Did you have to call an ambulance? And it's a really good way to keep the record. Now with all of these forms, you can either keep a form register or you can scan them and attach them to the student file and then make sure that you've got a link to it to a register. So you've got some sort of register for that. 
Um, so all of these can be made electronic um, and you do have PDF versions, so you can convert the PDF versions into fillable um, PDFs as well. So all of these forms uh, are on Unicorn. So for all of our members who are, have a consult membership, you have access to all of the documents and all of these that I'm going through today. So the next one is complaints and appeals. So um, we go through this as a separate standard, but it's looking at um, complaints and appeals process and making sure that it's clear and transparent for anybody to complete. So you minute, um, when you do, you hold your meetings, you only minute if there was a complaint or an appeal over the last month. Um, and it's an, a way to identify opportunities for improvement from the complaints and appeals, or it could even be a WHS incident that may come in as a complaint as well. So um, the idea is, is to uh, table the complaints and appeals at your monthly meeting to identify how can you uh, minimise the risk of that incident occurring again or that uh, complaint or appeal occurring again. So as I stated already, the key to all of this, and it's the easiest way to manage your ongoing continuous improvement, is to hold regular meetings. So we recommend, you know, one day, like once a month, um, and it would, should only go for about an hour with um, continuous improvement. So you should uh, schedule about an hour. This all depends on the size and scope of your operations and how many team members that you have. Uh, could be much quicker if there's only you, me, myself and I attending the meeting, um, but it could also be quite big if there was like, no, it might be 20 people attending the meeting. So it's uh, to be scalable according to your team size. So with the Q&C meeting, you should be scheduling for a regular day each month. So it could be the first Monday of each month. It could be the last Friday of each month. You can schedule it however uh, you'd like, as long as you're uh, including your continuous improvement process throughout there. You can also hold the Q&C meeting with your management meeting. Um, and you could just add your management meeting to the minutes if you wanted to do it that way or you could just have them run concurrently. So there's lots of different ways that you can do that. Uh, concerning high risk, okay, I've just got a question. Uh, concerning high risk work training, I am constantly asked what I don't have a tick, the a tick in the box. What can we do to cover, overcome this? So are you talking about assessment tools that doesn't have a tick in the box? So I'm just trying to work out what you mean. Give me some context into that. Um, it's any high risk work. Yeah, you don't need tick box questions. Um, it is a range of questions that you would have there. What license is it? Um, I'm unmuting you, Hilton. I can see your hands raised. You mustn't have a microphone working because I'm trying to uh, do that. So what licenses? Oh, there we go. go. Yep. Okay. Yeah, well, concern that continuous improvement that and I deal with all the big companies like Cranes and all that stuff. And surprising when you go to ask them to give you a bit of a feedback, take the time to write something down so we know where to follow. So much so that I've ignored all of them lately and I'm going ahead training with other training packs we're making equipment, but they correct their answer to me is oh we're flat out can't we just have a tick in the box thing you know and, and what you just said there is not really uh acceptable to ask one um how could we overcome this sort of thing when they're flat out and they want to just tick the box uh, they're not saying get out the door we're not going to answer you but that's all they want to do so is this giving industry feedback that you're talking yes, about mate. yes mate yeah 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 okay all right, so um, you can do it in a range of different ways. So you can either, um, you can do a survey, but you should also have other strategies. Um, it could be, you know, meeting them on the work site. You don't even have to have a form to collect the data. You can have a conversation with them and then record that. It could be recorded in your phone, um, either a voice memo, or you could record the meeting. What did you talk about? What actions are you going to take to improve your practices? Um, so it's just a recording of that. And then the great thing is with that industry consultation is take it to your Q&C meeting 
and it's one of your agenda items and you bring it up and, and elaborate on it at the Q&C meeting. So it's one way to be able to formalise informal um, industry consultation. Does that help, Hilton? Yeah, it does, mate. It does, yeah. Gotcha. yeah. Thanks, Excellent, excellent. Okay. Um, and I know, I know how difficult it is because it's not just you having time, it's them having time. Yeah. To, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so um, and that is a great way to formalise informal assessment validation is doing it that way. Okay, cool. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the question, Hilton. That's great. Thanks, Doug. Okay. So um, with the Q&C meeting, set a regular date. Hold the meeting even if it is just one person. So that means um, that you're sitting, even if it's just one person, you're just going through and going, was there any complaints and appeals? If there was, this is what we did. Was there any opportunity of improvement? If there was, this is what we did. Was there any WHS instances? If there was, this is what we did. So it's just recording that. And the big one is... Did we have any industry consultation? Who did I talk to? What did I learn? What practices are we improving based on that feedback that we've received and recording it in minutes? Then you formalized your informal industry consultation. So it's a, it's a great way to do it. Um, and it is recognized as data that you've collected. The big thing is, is not just taking that data and collecting it, the big thing is using it. So it's going into your training and assessment strategies, updating those, looking at the practices that you can improve. What most RTOs do is they learn something new from industry and they just implement it, but they don't update the training and assessment strategy and they don't minute it. So what um, when you're audited, what they're concerned about is where did you get this data from? No, and, and they want to see a record of you doing that continuous improvement. So that's what's really important about holding the Q&C meeting. Um, so record that data that's collected. Um, of course, watch the Vivacity membership webinar um, after, each, after each meeting. So you could, you know, you've done this webinar. So once you've attended this webinar, you should minute that you've attended this webinar as well. Um, and in those minutes, what did you learn? What do we need to change? Is there anything we need to improve? Um, and just you know, do feedback on attending this webinar. So, and this is your PD every month as well. Um, this meeting ties together all of your compliance and makes it so much easier for managing your ongoing compliance. Uh, the process is in the Q&C manual on the, under clause 2.2. You should have all received this poster, the Continual Improvement Cycle poster. It's also available on vivacity.training, so you can access the poster on there. It's under membership, so when you go to the um, membership course, you'll find that this poster is in there. This Continuous Improvement Cycle includes you know, what clauses we're going to be reviewing each month. Um, and the, the whole purpose of this is to minimise your um, ongoing continuous improvement. Instead of having to you know, review everything all at once, each month we go through a couple of clauses and do it in small bite-sized chunks to make it so much easier for you to manage your ongoing compliance. So following this webinar, you should be reviewing what are your policies, procedures, what are you actually doing? Um, are you not following our policies and procedures? It's also, these webinars are also really good because it's a way for you to learn the policies and procedures without having to read a 180 page policy and procedure manual. So it makes your life much easier by just doing it in videos and focusing on you know, what you need to do within your RTO. So we have a number of documents that you can use uh, for meetings. So a meeting minutes template and an agenda template. Now, depending on the size of your operations will depend on whether you use both of these. Um, you could just have a meeting agenda that you just use all the time and it's one that you follow. It's the minutes that is really important is keeping a record of that. So within those agenda items, uh, it's industry consultation. So who did you consult with? What did you learn? What practices are you going to improve based on that feedback? Uh, the trainers report, so what did they learn, um, how have they improved their practices, have they got any opportunities for improvement that they've identified. Quality indicator reporting, so just because you get your student feedback and you're only meant to support um, submit your report once a year, doesn't mean you shouldn't review it on a monthly basis because in a year's time that data is not going to be relevant. 
you're better off reviewing it once a month to identify are there any opportunities for improvement through the month, so each month, and you're at least touching base with it once a month. Using the continuous improvement cycle, so it's looking at the standards that we're reviewing, so as per uh, that poster that we went to, um, it's having a look at that and having a look at the standards that we're reviewing, uh, this one here. So it's having a look at that. So it's including that in your minutes. Um, general administration and training issues, you can put that in there as well. If there's been any changes or going to be some changes within the training packages that you work with, um, opportunities for improvement, were there any that were submitted and then discussing that, WHS instances and complaints and appeals. Now, with all of these, if there wasn't a complaint and appeal, there wasn't a WHS incident, there wasn't an opportunity for improvement, there's not going to be cha any changes to the training packages, you just put not applicable or um, no report submitted because it wasn't, you still keep it as an agenda item, but you just state that there was no reports that were submitted um, that need to be reviewed. So, but keep the agenda item there, but just uh, report on what, what happened in the last month. Okay, um, so one of the ways, and this is going to be crucial right now for the annual declaration of compliance is having annual internal audits. Now, the um, annual declaration of compliance is compliance from the 1st of January last year to the 31st of December last year. So you can actually hold a internal audit or get vivacity in to do an audit um, anywhere after the 31st of December and use that data as part of your report. So, um, so it is a much easier way if we're doing it with you, where we're able to do um, an internal audit with you and then you can use that data in your report. Now, the big thing is, is with the um, annual declaration of compliance is um, if you do have gaps, you do have non-compliances that you state that you do, and then what you're going to do to improve those practices. So, because what um, I see this one will change a bit in the new standards. Uh, I can't see this one staying, but um, it will be different. It'll just be a different way that they're gonna audit it. Uh, one of the things that I think they're going, they might do is you may be required to get an external body to come in and do an annual audit with you. Uh, because at the moment, what's happening with the annual declaration of compliance, most people are just saying, yes, compliant, 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 compliant. They get to an audit, they're non-compliant. And the issue is, if you said you were compliant and there are critical non-compliances, they can actually take action against you uh, because you said you were compliant. Although I haven't seen anybody get pulled up on that yet. I don't know whether you have, Amanda. No, nah, no, nah, I haven't seen anybody. And that's where I think they really need to strengthen this one. Um, if they're going to make you do an annual audit, they want to have some sort of process for monitoring that as well. So this is what we recommend. You should do an internal audit. So this is the procedure. If you go into your Q&C manual, you'll see the whole process in there. But as a snapshot, it's sourcing what are the current regulatory requirements and updates. And there is a self-assessment form that you can use. So you go on to asqua.gov.au and you can uh, download the self-assessment tool. Now, I have a link for you. So I'll just uh, get that link for you and I'll share it with you. Um, for this is information about the annual declaration of compliance. So I'm going to be popping in the chat. Um, so these are typical questions that they get asked about that. And then there is also a self-assessment tool, which is in my next um, uh, slide. So it's sourcing, you know, uh, there's things like uh, strategic reviews, strategic direction, um, fact sheets that have come out. There's lots of things that you could have a look at, at on the ASCA website. The user guide is also another thing that you can do um, and have a look at the standards from there. I did hear from an auditor last week that the TVA and annual deck of compliance are being looked at more thoroughly this year than previous years. Yeah, they have to. Uh, failure to lodge or failure to lodge on time may trigger an audit. So make sure you get them 
lodged. <laughs> um, I will be going th through when the deadline is for that, but yeah, make sure you get your reports lodged. Okay, so you should review all the relevant state and Commonwealth legislation. So looking at any other legislation that is relevant to your organisation as well, and make sure that you are complying with those requirements as well. Um, complete the full report for the ASQA self-assessment tool. So you can access that tool and that's a great tool you can use for undertaking a self-assessment um, because the one, when you complete the annual declaration of compliance, it's an online form. And I think it kicks you out if you don't do it all in one go. Um, I'm not sure about that. Um, whereas if you do the uh, one that you, the self-assessment tool that you download from the ASCO website, you've got the document there to review. Has Amanda got something to say? No. <laughs> okay, so complete the self-assessment tool, provide uh, the report to the CEO. If you are the CEO, you can just review it yourself. Um, review any non-compliances and identify an action plan for rectifying any of those non-compliances that you may have. Now, the beauty of doing this before, um, before the end of the year is you can do those rectifications. So you could do this in November, December, and you can identify improvements and fix those before the end of the year. So it's at end of a calendar year. Uh, but now, if you, haven't, um, if you haven't done that, or if you have done an internal audit um, and you have that data collected, make sure that you've acted on that. So what have you done to improve your practices based on that? Okay, so um, in the policy and procedure manual, you'll see a lot more data in there. So the next one, this is the self-assessment tool. So I'm just gonna see if I can copy that. No, not let me. Let's see if it takes me to the link. Um, so the self-assessment tool is available on the website, so you can access it on the uh, website um, on ASPA. So it's uh, standards backslash self-assessment um, tool. So you should be able to get that. No. Let's see if I can find it. I think Kira is trying to find it now. Let's see who gets it first. I'll leave it to is looking up the link <laughs> so that's the link there um, and it should be conducted prior to your annual declaration of compliance there you go there's a link so um, you can download this form and you can use this form and uh, conduct this first before you go to do the online version uh, for your report thanks Kira uh, so so uh, clause 8.4 is all about the annual declaration of compliance. And as Amanda said, uh, this will be changing. I actually have changed the dates here. Um, so some of the things that you need to be aware of is making sure that you've received the email. You should have already received the email. If you have not received the email, and, and if you, you may not know, if you don't know, um, you need to ask your CEO because it will go to the CEO. If you haven't received the email, there is a process for um, getting the email again. So the annual declaration of compliance is very important for both uh, the providers and was sent on the 12th. Yes, it was. I've got that on the next slide. Um, so it was sent on the 12th of February and you should check your junk. That's the other area. Let's make sure it hasn't gone to your junk uh, email. And the other one, other thing that happens is people have um, uh, reported ASQA's email address as junk um, or unsubscribed to ASQA and then they don't get the email. Um, the other one is they've blocked it, they've blocked the email address because it's the same email address where you get your all your newsletters and things like that. So make sure that you're checking that they're not blocked and I'll um, show you what that email is soon. Um, but I would whitelist anything that is at asqua.gov.au. So make sure you whitelist anything that comes. So it should be um, asterisk at asqua.gov.au. Um, and making sure that you've whitelisted that so you don't miss it. Because we actually saw a couple of years ago, we had a whole heap of clients who didn't get the email or ignored it, and then they uh, were at risk of getting cancellation. 
So they received a nasty letter from ASQA saying that we intend to cancel your registration because you didn't do your annual declaration of compliance. So it's a simple online form and it only takes about 15 to 30 minutes to complete, but you should do the self-assessment beforehand. Otherwise, um, it will take you a lot longer. So ask we've sent an email to the RTO CEO as listed on training.gov.au. So that's the other thing is go on to TGA and make sure that your current CEO is actually listed as the CEO on TGA. If they're not, there's your first non-compliance because it is a requirement that you update ASCO within 90, uh, business, uh, 90 days of any changes in CEO and senior management. So, um, so that will be something you'll need to have a look at. Each email has a unique URL that can only be used by the one RTO. You can't share it. So don't think you can share the link from someone else because otherwise you'll be filling in someone else's report. Um, so, and I wouldn't share it because you don't want someone to be putting <laughs> that you're non-compliant and everything. Um, so it's very unique to you. Um, and it's an online form and you need to, you have until midnight on the 31st of March to get it submitted. So you've got until that time. So if you haven't done an internal audit yet, this should be one of your high value activities uh, to be done within the next couple of weeks. And then from that, you're going to be able to do your report. If you identify any non-compliances, you, you should put together an action plan on how you're going to improve those practices. So if you didn't receive the email from ASQA, you need to get in contact with ASQA. Um, the big thing is check your spam, your junk, uh, check that your email address is correctly listed on TGA. Um, if the address is incorrect, you need to get in contact with ASQA and advise them of the update. Um, there is also a link here where you can find out more. I've actually put this link already up. So that was the one I put up already, um, which is all about those FAQs. So frequently, frequently asked questions about the annual declaration of compliance. So after you submit your declaration, you'll be able to print and save a PDF copy, which I do recommend, um, or you can uh, get an email of the uh, answers. Um, and I would, um, when you do your internal audit, that's an opportunity for improvement, should be tabled at your Q&C meeting. So looking at how you're going to improve your practices based on what you've found. Once the declaration has been submitted, you won't be able to submit another one. <laughs> That's it. So make sure you get it right the first time. Any questions around the annual declaration of compliance? Has anybody submitted yet? If you have, can you raise your hand? Nope, so we've all got a bit of work. <laughs> so you may, need to make sure you schedule some time for doing the self-assessment. Uh, download that form, have a look at it, and identify um, what you need to do in order to prepare for submission of your annual declaration of compliance. Oakley doakley. Um, so moving on, so clause 8.4 is the RTO provides an annual declaration of compliance with these standards. Um, and what they currently meet. And um, the idea is what happens is ASQA will randomly select 5% of the reports that come through and review them. So uh, it was actually an ASQA auditor who told me this. So they randomly select 5% and review them. So you don't want to be the unlucky 5%. Um, and they, what they will do is they, particularly if you've got audit coming up, if you've got one coming up, so it might be a re-reg, uh, they will have a look at that when you go to re-reg. So they'll be having a look at that this year um, with your re-registration. So you want to make sure that you, um, so it's okay. It's, it's I'm going to say it's okay if you have non-compliances, but it depends on how bad they are. It's the plan you put in place to rectify those non-compliances, the action you take. So these things happen. It's what are you doing to improve your practices to make sure that you know, you're taking remedial action, in particular, if you haven't collected sufficient evidence to deem a student competent, what remedial action are you taking? Um, are you updating your assessment tools? There's a range of different things that you could be doing. 
and that should be identified from the report that you've done. So the self-assessment. Now, if you're a newly registered RTO, so I know, um, Andrew, this is you, so you're a newly registered. Um, so all current RTOs that were registered as of, and this should be 2020, sorry, I haven't changed that. If you were registered before the 31st of December 2020, you are required to submit an annual declaration of compliance, even if you haven't delivered any training. So you still need to submit the report, even though you haven't submitted. If you got your registration after the 31st of December, then you won't be doing it until next year. So it starts from the 1st of January to the 31st of December. So you don't need to worry about it until next year. So um, even if you were registered it before the 31st of December, you will need to do this. And you will, even if you are registered on the 30th of December, you will still need to do the annual declaration of compliance. So uh, this is something that you'll be required to do. If you're not registered yet, you don't need to worry about this. That'll be the next step. So how to complete the annual declaration. So um, check the emails, go to the CEO email. Uh, the form will be, um, it was available already in February and you have until the end of March. Um, and this allows the provider over a month to undertake the self-assessment. Uh, you can save the online form and return to it at any time. There you go. So you can do that. So that was on their website. So what happens if you don't complete it? You put your RTO at risk of cancellation because it's a non-compliance with the standards. So if you don't submit it on time, if you don't submit it at all, you're going to get a nasty letter from ASWA with the intent to cancel your registration. So this is very, very important that you're doing, do this and get it submitted. Um, and we have seen in the past where there were a large number of RTOs whose registration got canceled because they didn't submit. Um, can you apply for an extension? Um, ASK will not accept any late submissions um, and the, commence the declaration form well in advance. You should start it now, start having a look at it, uh, download that self-assessment form and start working on it now. So how to prepare? Um, the best way, best method is to get an independent self-assessment uh, self or audit, um, which you can get ASQA in to do a systems check as well. Although I think we're not ASQA, Vivacity. <laughs> we're not ASQA. I think we're booked out though. Are we booked out for the whole March? We might squeeze one in. No, yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty booked out. So, um, uh, so you'll need to conduct an internal audit of all your systems and practices, review what you are doing against the policies and procedures within the Q&C manual um, and complete the ASQA self-assessment uh, tool as well. So use that tool that we've provided. So after you submit your application, you'll be able to print it and um, you won't be able to resubmit after you've done that. Okay. So 8.5 and 8.6 is all about complying with all of the other legislation. So this is important when you go to do your annual declaration of compliance as well, because it's all about, you know, there are maybe other legislation that you need to comply with as an RTO, uh, in particular, if you're working in certain industries that have other regulatory requirements around it, such as security licensing, it might be work cover, there's other areas. You need to make sure that you're complying with all of those and that your policies and procedures include um, how you comply with those. Um, it should also be in your student handbook if it's a requirement for the students to also comply. If they're doing work placement or practical, um, they will also need to understand what their responsibilities are as a student when it comes to uh, legislation that is relevant to your training that you deliver. So here's some key legislation that you need to be aware of. These are some key ones for the, educa the education sector. So the, the VET quality framework, um, if you've got CRACOS, it's a national code, uh, privacy protection, work health and safety, child protection, working with children, industrial relations law, copyright and intellectual property. So there's a whole heap, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole heap of other legislation 
um, that you may need to comply with as well. So you really need to look at your industry sector as well of what you will need to comply with. Uh, but these are the standard ones for RTOs that they'll need to comply with. Right, so that's the standards for today. Um, I just want to remind everyone the eight critical drivers to RTO success masterclass um, has commenced. So we're now running a masterclass on the eight critical drivers to RTO success. It's specifically looking at uh, the business of an RTO and what you need in order to be successful. And it's looking at I know, marketing, business development, financial viability that is specifically for RTOs. It's free to all members. So it's free to members who are, sorry, I should say VIP course members and all of our consult members. So it's free for you. It's $40 for everybody else. Um, and it's on the second Wednesday of each month. So I highly recommend that you get along if you haven't. I think everyone's been registered. Is that right, Kira? Yeah. So you've already been registered. But if you have not been registered, because you might be um, someone else from within the organization, not our key contact person, you can get in, get in contact with Kira and Kira can add you to the list. So it's emailing uh, kira at vivacity.com.au um, and, and Kira will be able to add you to the list. And, uh, and we'll, we just need to check your membership level as well to make sure that you are eligible for that. Um, there is a free version of the very first one we did on our website, which is called the eight critical drivers to RTO success. Um, if you have a login to Vivacity Training, you'll already see it in there. So you'll see that course in there. That first one that I did was an overview of what are the eight critical drivers. The people who attended loved it. They got a lot out of it. And I was just doing an overview of the drivers. So the next ones, um, and as Kira's uh, stated there, uh, we will be focusing on one of the critical drivers each month. And next month is students and clients. So we'll be focusing on students and clients and what strategies you can put in place to get more students and get more clients. That's what that's all about. It's not about compliance. Uh, critical drivers, there is, one stand, there is one of the critical drivers which is about compliance. All of the others is all about business. It's all about how to get more bums on seats um, and what you need to do in order to grow your RTO. Okay, uh, I've already done a vet reform update. So you've already got the update there. Um, the next webinar, I haven't updated all these slides, um, is in March. So the next one in March is a Monday, Monday the 1st. So the 1st of March um, is the next one and we will be looking at trainers and assessors. This is one of the top non-compliances at audit is trainers and assessors. So we'll be looking at you know, uh, standard 1.13 to 1.20, which is all about trainers and assessors, staff matrix, PD. Um, highly recommend if you haven't done it yet, and I know Amanda's, Amanda's chomping at the bit to say something. Um, if you haven't done it yet, the Stellar Trainer Scorecard. So the Stellar Trainer Scorecard is, uh, and I think if Kira can pop that in the chat, the link to the Stellar Trainer Scorecard. If you haven't done it yet, um, it's a scorecard that is free, um, that will give you a message. Oh, today's the 1st of March. Yeah, 5th of April. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, I'm lost, totally lost. Oh my goodness, we're already up to April, <laughs> okay. Um, oh, ASCO has released a new spotlight for trainers and assessors with a series of webinars. Do you want to say something about that, Amanda? Do you know about it? That's primarily all it is. They've got a series of episodes that they're doing talking about what are the requirements for trainers and assessors. Um, and the first one's talking about their training and assessment qualifications. So then it seems like the series will go through all of the trainer assessor requirements in um in little bite-sized packages. So the first webinar is coming up. Um, oh, where's the date gone? I'll have that for you very shortly. It's coming up very soon. And it's definitely worth registering for April 22nd. April 22nd, so get on and register for that. So this is all free PD? 
um, that you can attend. I know because ASCO got um, slapped around a bit because they weren't providing any training for the RTO industry. And this has been the response there. Um, and they're targeting training assessors, which is great. Um, also this, got another webinar on, on Wednesday as well. This Wednesday, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So yes. keenly, keenly encourage you to get onto the ASCO website. There's also on the ASCO website, they actually also list um, all of their events. So you can go to, um, and I'm just finding the link for you. Um, you can just go to their events page, which has all of the events on there. So check that out. So I've just popped that link in there um, and you can check out all the events. Now, these events book out really quickly. So I would highly recommend you get on as soon as possible and register uh, so that you can get access to this free PD. Uh, but it's also identifying um, what ASQA have identified as gaps in uh, particularly for trainers and assessors. The scorecard that we've developed is also about the gaps. It's about the gaps in, um, that we've seen in audit and what has been the non-compliances at audit. So uh, the idea is, is that uh, your, all of your trainers can complete the scorecard and when they complete the scorecard, it will give them a ranking. So you'll get a ranking and it's benchmarked against um, what we have identified is a high risk and a low, low risk. Uh, and they get a report that is emailed to them. And in that report, it tells, gives you some suggestions on what you could do as a trainer to improve your score. So it's a really good scorecard. We're getting some really good feedback from people who have already completed it. Um, so if you haven't yet, I highly recommend you get on and do that scorecard. We're using the data that we collect from the scorecard to identify where we're going to provide training for trainers and assessors based on that data. So what, how they answered the questions, how long it took them to answer the questions. Um, but from that, we will be identifying future training uh, for trainers and assessors because it is a um, high gap area that we, we have identified. So it's timed in really well that ASPA are doing a session and we're going to be talking about trainers and assessors next month. Okay, and that's it for today. So thank you very much for attending today's webinar. Um, please remember that all of the webinars are recorded and you'll have access to it on Vivacity Training. Um, and we love to see you at future uh, webinars as well. Thank you very much for attending today's session. And we look forward to seeing you at the Mastermind, which is every Monday at 10.30 a.m. So thank you, everyone. Have an awesome week and I'll see you soon. Bye.